like it comes individuals and they have the capacity for the journey yeah there's a lot of people that got the talent and the skill Welcome back to the Two Months Podcast and Happy New Year to everyone and all our listeners, all our sponsors. I'm your host, Joshua Marshall. Uh, we have a very special guest with us. He is the uh, first guest of 2024. Uh, he is a two-time Stanley Cup champion, longtime executive in the National Hockey League. And uh, you can find him on uh, Sportsnet 590 uh, with Kipper and Bourne and all the other great uh, channels that they have there. Uh, we have Mike Fuda back with us. Futes, how's it going? Let's just get this out of the way right away, my friend, here. First of all, okay. you always throw all these accolades about myself and my thing. So let's get this. First of all, Happy New Year. And secondly, congratulations on achieving the next step of your dream, buddy. That's uh, When I saw that, I could just feel your internal happiness. Uh, and to finally, you know, like a kid in a candy shop at your, with your new position and getting your press pass through the Calgary Flames and stuff. And I could just picture you in that media scrum just with your feet not even on the ground. Yeah, it was... Uh, Good for you, was, bud. I remember, yeah. I remember I got in trouble in Calgary. Um, I didn't know all the little rules that go with the National Hockey League about yeah. when you're your opponent. So first, I screwed up twice. First time I come out, so we go into Calgary. And it just had it's my first road trip in management. So Calgary's having their morning skate and I fire right out onto the bench to have a chat with Gio. And then I realize you're not allowed to be on the bench when the, well, I get told it's a huge fine. If the visiting team management goes on the bench, <laughs> well, the other team's practicing, which, okay. And then little do I know. So then I go down to the Calgary dressing room and it's open. So I go in and they're having the press scrum and there's like 15 guys around Gio's stall so I sit in the back and I start asking questions about his ball hockey career. <laughs> and then I find out that it's an even bigger fine if management goes into the visiting team's dressing room without credit. So yeah. anyways, you learn all these lessons as you become this massive media star in the, uh, in the press thing. But congratulations again, buddy. I could feel your uh, passion and your happiness. And I was very proud of you. Yeah, no, I have to. I know I didn't, uh, so I apologize. I didn't tag you in the tweet, but uh, at the end of the day, Futes, uh, if anyone uh, out of all these people I've got to know through the circuit of the hockey community, um, huge stick taps for you for showing uh, belief in me because uh, not only uh, in that terms of you know, feeling comfortable come on this podcast and talk to me, you've uh, you set up set us up with like the, you know the Trevor Lewis's and the Justin Williams and the Tyler Toffoli's and the Milan Lucic's all these guys uh these are the Rolodexes that you've uh, helped us out in gaining credibility so uh so I, I appreciate all the all the efforts you've done there for us it, my uh, pleasure it's well worth it yeah no well, you, I don't know what that meant Luch and I Luch and I were one year or sorry Biz and then Biz too we had Biz that was as we ever I'm going to take credit for you. I'm going to take credit for that massive rating. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that Although was I'm big. sure there were people that were actually tuning in for this. <laughs> but I think you added a great component to it for sure. But uh yeah, it was uh you know, there was a lot of emotions to it. Uh the thing was this was a possibility last year. I could not find it in me at all to get into that situation. I don't know. I was just I had no confidence. I didn't have the courage to do it. The Flames have been like amazing to me in the last three, four years. Like I cannot thank Peter Hanlon and Kel Sean Kelso and the rest of that staff. And obviously, you know, you know, tree better than I do, but I've had one dealing in my entire life with Brad tree living. And it was a moment of empathy and compassion and everything he's done for me. And, you know, he's off to bigger and better things right now with the, with the lease. He's got a bigger thing to take care of. Not that he didn't have a big thing to take care of in Calgary, but uh, you know, Calgary to, Toronto is a different uh, animal in its own right, but um, yeah, it was it was pretty sweet, and you know, just kind of getting chatting with some of the the you know the media horde there and you know, stuff like that. The, they're all uh, very nice, very easygoing, um, emotional, um, you know, because uh, Christmas morning was not the best, uh, you know, and obviously uh, December twenty third is a tough day for me. It's the anniversary of my dad's passing, and. And then I got some uh, some real bad news on Christmas morning, and so I've had a uh, I've had a rough go. And the unfortunate part is this was a great opportunity for me, and I haven't been able to share it with someone that I love the most. And uh, you know, hopefully, uh, I know that that person listens to this podcast, so maybe in the way that this is the way I can share how it is. But 
yeah. So, um, love that person with my entire heart and, and, uh, yeah, so we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll enjoy this, uh, this journey, the whole foods. It was pretty cool. And obviously I'll be back there and, uh, had a really good chat with Michael Backlund last night on doing some things with him, uh, in the near future. So the possibility for, for new opportunities is, is there, um, win or lose. Uh, the flames won. So, so that was good. It was, uh, it was a, it was a tough one. We were, we, we ended up, uh, they were up pretty good there. They came back. I think they're up four, two. And we got in the elevator and like the flyers, healthy scratches kind of guys like Mark Stahl gets in the elevator with us. And we're like, and, uh, so yeah, we're kind of going down the elevator cause we have to go get ready to do the post game press conference and stuff like that. And so we're all kind of just watching by the TV when we got down to see what was going on. <laughs> Cause it was like nail biting, but uh, yeah, the flames ended up pulling it off four, three. It was a good game. Um, I don't know how much of the flames you've saw lately, um, you know, but we can talk about that real quick. Obviously there was a bit of a Bronx cheer when Markstrom made the save uh, the last two games. He allowed the first shot of the, of the, of the game in. And um, so when he made a save, uh, the fans kind of gave him a good old cheer, but he played really good. Nazem Kadri played good. Um, I thought Jonathan Huberto looked very more engaged to back to where he should be. Um, and I got to see him a lot in Florida. Um, and that was kind of nice to see. And Dennis Gilbert had an amazing game and Magipani had three assists. So there was, uh, there was a lot of great wins all, all the way around, but, um, from what you've seen from, from afar, um, your thoughts on the recent play of the Calgary Flames are still out of a playoff picture, but they got a big road trip here coming up. Uh, just, you know what? It's hard to say. I mean, obviously everybody with what went on with Daryl last year, everybody was like, well, where do you see this group this year with this, you know, with all the pressure gone with coach and if it wasn't for Markstrom early, they would have been in big right. trouble. Yeah. Really in big trouble. And I, I, it's a tough one. There's a lot of, obviously Craig's, you know, it's his first, uh, his first kick the can as a general manager and he's probably got some thoughts and feelings. And then you go through that whole period in the off season that whether you know, you're going to, your top guys really do want to stay. And, and uh, it's such a great hockey city, um, but it, it's, it's, it's just so many moving pieces there with all those UFAs. And I think that seeing the lack of production on a consistent basis that you've really got to start looking at the opportunity to move some of these pieces out and, and start with some fresh looks. Um, and I don't think really there's anybody um uh, there's a couple guys you want to keep it. I mean, it's almost like there's it's that point. Some guys are very difficult to trade with their with their contracts and stuff. But I'd be looking under every rock possible to see if there's a deal possible with the Montreal Canadiens for Huberdeau. Um, I'd be I'd be looking at obviously you've got these UFAs like I think Blake Hannafin's a UFA. I mean Zadorov they've already moved on from. Hannafin's an F. Hannaf for me is the one that Lynn Holm too. Yeah, Lindholm, another great player. But it's it, the hard part is, is is the teams that are looking for these pieces are so up against it against the salary cap. And uh, from what I've heard, and rightfully so, Craig is asking for a like everybody has this big thing about Toronto and Calgary. What a you know there, there's a match made in heaven with regards to players that obviously Brad would know really well and who he covets. But I got to think that the Calgary Flames that's probably their least likely dance party. A dance partner because you just don't <laughs> there's always that friction of you know if you're Craig do you really want to possibly lose a trade or make your ex-general manager and another Canadian hockey market uh, get his wishes I mean I would think that the price is probably extra got an extra cherry on top if you're talking to the Toronto Maple Leafs about one of those prospects and uh, and again and I get back and I'm going to pat the Los Angeles Kings. And it's not, I mean, I haven't been there for quite a while, but I know when I was there, one of the things I took great pride in was really on top of the great players we had and that we were really home built um, was the ability to put a lot of, just fill the shelves, mm -hmm. fill the shelves with prospects and not just your high level guys, your first rounders. Like we had like six or seven guys we took in the sixth or seventh round that have played over 500 games in the league. Like Matty Roy's doing it now. Um, even there's some guys that we didn't think would, we, you know, we kind of thought we missed on like Mikey Eisenmont and Johnny Brodzinski that are finding homes in other, in other places. So to be able to do that and then Mark Yanetti completely and his staff have continued to do it. And you start to look what you can do and what you can add when you get a guy like Faber 
right? Who <laughs> yep. this guy's potential rookie of the year candidate. And I mean, they move him and they bring in a guy like Fiala, right? In favor of being anybody, he's, he's got a chance to be a legitimate number one, which is not, it's kind of unheard of anymore having a number one. Uh, and then you, you, you know, whether you like the trade or you don't like the trade, it probably has worked out for both. I mean, Dubois not really, you know, he, I mean, as a third line center, you're just going crazy. You're happy, but he's not really playing up to his, Stand. his standards. And, but I mean, Gabe Velarde, you know, uh, I, Alex, I follow Casper Capri. Uh, you've got all that draft arsenal and all that, those extra assets that you can turn into a bona fide NHL player and they still, like you look at that team, how hard they are to play against. Um, probably, they're probably a little concerned about the structure, their goaltending, as far as, you know, is Cam Talbot the guy? Is Phoenix Copley the guy? But, I mean, you look in their back end and you talk about right shot defensemen. And then it allows them to go out and get a guy like Gavrikov that's a perfect fit, you know. But their best prospect isn't even on the team. Yeah, Grant Clark is playing, like, this guy's going to be a star. And I mean, these guys are, they're not even able to make the team yet. So you see a team like that. And then you, again, respectfully, you go to Calgary. And I mean, I know last year, Daryl really put up a wall with regards to guys like Phillips and Peltier and Wolf coming up because he didn't see them as legitimate NHL prospects. And, uh, and when you have that issue, um, it's hard if you don't believe in, I mean, other teams, you've got to have a dance partner that loves you. Everybody loves their own prospects. That's another problem. Yeah. Right? And then sometimes the other teams don't feel as strongly about what you have in your, in your holster to deal. Uh, and again, I look at Toronto as a team that I think Kyle really left the shelves. I mean, empty. I mean, whether or not, I mean, they're, they're a well-oiled machine based on, you know, the Matthews and the guys that they picked in the top five. I mean, Marners and you know Nylanders and Morgan Riley was picked with Brian Burke was there but I mean you look at their assets and you're like okay is there anybody coming up like Robertson looks like he's spittled you know he's fitting in okay as a good third line player but you don't see any stud coming up in the back end I mean you probably got to be really happy with the fact that um you know I think a lot of people including myself thought Easton Talon was taken pretty high and he looks like he's the real deal i mean yeah as far as being a guy that's going to be able to play in the bottom six and, and be really effective and i guess minton's another guy but after that is there really anybody that gets you like if you're trying to deal on the leaf side of things that you you know you've got to move out salary you are probably looking now i think in the one part you you were really excited about was samsonov coming in for another year after the year he had and now he's gone you know he went full full Jack Campbell and <laughs> it's like the mental side of things took over in the, in the puck is get, it looks like the size of a pea getting shot at him yeah. with, his, with his confidence gone. And that's it. That's a tough thing. That's, that's a problem in Toronto that you just didn't expect to see was that kind of goaltending. And then you get all excited that wall starting to look good and then he blows his knee out. So I don't even know the guy Hill to be or whatever the guy's name is. It's they called some guy up, but it could yeah, be Dennis Hill, Hill to be I had to Google. I had to Google him. Uh, so He's had good numbers last year, and his numbers are pretty good this year. So, that's... And you never know. With something yeah. like that, it just yeah. happens. It's like we talk about – it's like right now what's going on in the NFL. You're like, you've got to look at who who's quarterbacking for this team today, and then all of a sudden they go on these little runs. And it's just – it reminds me very much of these goalies that somehow come in and, you know, Copley did it last year. I mean, obviously it caught up with him a bit this year, but, I mean, he came in and you're like looking at this guy, like this guy couldn't play for Arizona or whatever, and he's like 14-2. and two. Yeah, it's a lot to do with the structure that your team has. So it'll be interesting. The hardest part doing it in Toronto, like it's one thing to do it in a team like, uh, you know, you see the kid Kachichev that's doing it and coming in in Carolina because they're such a structured defensive team. Uh, you would think that, it, you know, like teams like that have those great blue lines, uh, like Aiden Hill can go in, in in Vegas and and these guys can go in in Vegas because they're such an incredible defensive core and then you look at a team like toronto that i mean obviously i don't think they're thrilled with their back end and the balance they have there so having a goalie that makes the saves that count matters yeah incredibly amount to huge when when you don't have a, a great great defensive core yeah it would be interesting to see like obviously i think uh tanev would be the guy tree would want that was 100 that would solidify what he needs on the back end and then 
you're probably a little bit more your confidence in in going forward. I'd almost yeah. overpay for Tanev if I was Toronto because there's, yeah. I mean, obviously you're gonna you could resign him as what. You no, know you're gonna resign him, right? Yeah. If you're yeah. comfortable with that, then it's then it's well. You just can't do it for a rental. No, no. So as long as he knows it, he can get him uh, done for an extension. Maybe it's a two year extension or. A three-year I'd be going crazy. I'd be going after Markstrom and uh, Tanev, and I'd give up any assets. Yeah, they wanted because you've got to again. And I had this, I had this disagree. Not so much a disagreement, but you've got it's. You could have these guys for a long time, whether they sign back Nylander and stuff like that. Yeah, there still is a window where you know Mark Giordano is only going to be Mark Giordano for a couple more years. Um, you still got to be careful with his minutes and stuff like that. But you've got some older players that on top of the, the, the great young ones, are, I mean, it seemed like they've been around forever with the Matthews and the Mars. You've got to capitalize on this window where they're all there for sure. Like yeah. you don't know what Mitch Marner is going to ask for and his next deal. I mean, you're hoping you can get Nylander signed, but there's a window where these guys are in their prime and you've got questions on the back end and questions in goal, which is not a good mix. So uh, to bring in, to overpay, whether even financially it could work, you'd obviously have to bring in like a Markstrom or a Tanev that you've taken away those question marks at such key areas while your top young guys are still in their prime. It's uh, it's critical. I mean, I was always that way. I know that's how Drew Doughty was so frustrated that, you know, and cope like three or four of their top years uh, of their prime was rebuilding, right? And that's a, t- that's a tough thing when you've got superstars and in fairness, good good on LA because they're back in NHL Stanley Cup contendership, and Dowdy and Copestar still looks like studs. But you got to be really careful about burning out your top guys' uh, they, best they years with with holes everywhere. They can't beat the Oilers right now, though. Feuds. What's your thought process on that? It was another game where the Kings dominated to start, and then. The others ended up finding a way to to pull that one out. Um, I know well, it's hard out, so it's you, you got elite out, players but... like that. I mean, like you could say, you could say that was a bad goal, or you can just say, "Oh my God, McDavid!" Like, like he drops his shoulder for two seconds, and all of a sudden, you know, the water bottles off the top of the net. So, yeah. you, you, when you've got, I don't look at it like I think this LA team would give this Oilers team fits in a playoff series. Uh, in one game, anything can happen. But when you've got two players, I mean, there's more than two players, but when Dreisaitl and McDavid are going, it kind of makes, Yeah, it doesn't matter who's on the other side to a certain extent when they've got it going. If As long as you've got a semblance of, like I thought Edmonton played one of their more structured games and the, the goaltending didn't kill them. That's got to happen in order for them to, to like, Todd's got Edmonton, uh, LA playing a real strong it's gonna be hard to play against in the playoffs and again it's a grind like you're not they're not gonna get into nine seven games like oh. it, it, every game's gonna be a grind like fourth and inches or third and inches if you're in the Canadian Football League but it's like it's it's a it's a battle and you could see it in Edmonton Edmonton was you know it still came down to a shootout so yeah that doesn't but I mean I'll tell you there's some matchups and even if you look at some of the teams that are on the outside looking in, like Vegas is going through a tough spot, but you got to think they've never really, they really haven't had a chance. They haven't even filled their full roster yet. I mean, you look at, you think about these teams that are, wow, we're missing this guy, this guy. And I mean, I mean, there's big pieces that have been out of the Vegas lineup all year long. Like, I mean, I think Theodore's out now, but there's, if they get healthy, they're going to be tough, but then you're starting to see teams like Seattle, you know, when you look at who's below the cut line, starting to play better hockey. Yeah. Um, Edmonton everybody's just kind of waiting for that <laughs> they quietly just keep creeping up creeping up like I don't think there's too many people that expect them to be on the outside looking in but you've got to take a team and go okay who's coming back to the pack and I mean obviously it's an easy thing to say Arizona but I mean they've been consistent and and you never know there's a team um, that lightning in a ball but if anybody has the assets and the cap space to do something to get better at the trade deadline. It's a team like that. Yeah. Uh, if they want to give up some of that draft capital and, uh, and they do have, they do have an opportunity to get better. And uh, it's, 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 it'll be interesting. I, I just am amazed. And in the East, you look and you still see teams like 
you know, I'm wondering how some teams are still where they are. I love the work ethic on Philly. I guess, as Tortorella says, we're not very good, but we have balls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Torts. That's great. great. Way to break your team down into balls. But it's, uh, it'll be interesting. Pittsburgh for me is like the one that I look at and go. And there's part of me when I look at what the Leafs are left that I don't really want to blow any, uh, get too many party horns out for Kyle to have success uh, with Pittsburgh. But it is what it is. I mean, that that team, when you see them below the cut line, the way Crosby's playing, that one's tough to fathom as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, very interesting. Very interesting for sure. So, um, yeah, I don't know where things go with the with the Penguins. They, they're going to have to do some kind of work. And gonna have to... All right. Well, we just learned that the uh, the mascot of the podcast is a huge Penguins fan, as Futes just said. So <laughs> just took everything out. Just too much to another. Too, too much to another. Yeah. level <laughs> wiped off the whole board got, everything. Got, i've never had a podcast crashed by a vicious animal attack yeah, yes he dropped his toy and he didn't know how to which way to go he didn't know. Kyle Dubis and the pittsburgh penguins like that yeah exactly well uh the bruno boy will make sure that never happens again so <laughs> um but yeah we'll see what happens with the penguins for sure there's a lot there you covered you covered a lot and a lot of things uh one of the things uh we'll go to the new jersey devils here we'll kind of talk about their situation but uh, before we get there let's uh let's talk about Ty Toffoli. uh uh he's got 15 goals on the year he's ha- on pace to you know surpass what he had last year he's he's having an amazing year with the with the devils um you know and he was here december 10th and uh he got to meet uh, young Ilya again and uh just a really good moment for both those for tyler and uh, young Ilya. but uh when you when you met Ty when you met Tyler uh, Futes, did you kind of see a lot of this in his demeanor? Like from what I understand, the family's really good people, um, so it's not shocking. But uh, you know, he kind of takes the time out of his schedule to uh, come ha- come up, have a conversation, sign some autographs, take some pictures. Um, can you kind of talk about the the person Tyler is, and you know, maybe maybe some other stories? But this story is a pretty cool one too. Well, he's just uh, it's a great. Uh, rags to riches stories i mean just a very humble background i mean his dad was a trainer on his team and you know ty as i said i think you know the junior canadians at the time everybody was going in to watch john mcfarland and i just every time i went i couldn't help like one of my coach dan cameron was coaching him and uh he just all he did was score goals um and he was quiet like really quiet like anybody that scores goals like that, like that much, I think he had like 60 or 70 goals. Like you've got to be confident, right? There's one thing, but it, there, you got no ants of um, like when he was with the Ottawa 67s, I remember when McFarlane was getting traded, I said, you make sure that he knows as soon as he walks through the door, that this is Tyler to Foley's team, right? You're not going to drop in back. You're not going to be the, the guy playing the, um, playing the triangle in the, in the Saturday night live skit, this is your band. And uh, you make sure um, that he understands that. And, and as Tyler began, started to get more confidence. And I think, cause you have to be a little bit cocky. And once he started, it was more of his body transition. Once he, cause he's still, he, everybody knocked his skating that he couldn't make. But once he, once he put in the work in the gym and his body started to blend in, and he, I mean, as I said, I used to joke about him and Jordan Nolan, like you, you, you could tell when like, if they ever went shirts and skins or something that he'd just be devastated if he was a skin because <laughs> he, all these other guys walking around jacked and then Tyler put in the work and you couldn't get a shirt on him. The guy was walking around without a shirt for us was like just so confident in himself. And uh, obviously you can tell when he's in a great space mentally. Um, and he's obviously, he's got a, wonderful wife and cat and you can tell he really enjoys where he he is like you can tell he's enjoying new jersey i saw a great video of him uh uh on with him playing you forget about the bomb when you win a championship but jonathan quick had had them all over for christmas and ty was in net they were playing mini sticks with all the kids downstairs and quickie and ty was in net one end and it was pretty cool uh to see these guys bond over christmas but it's also certain amount of chemistry, right? You can put people in certain aspects like 
they had match chemistry. I remember when Daryl put the seventies line together for 2014 and Pearson Carter and Toffoli just took off to another level. And you can clearly see the chemistry with him and Hughes. Um, and you think he's got 15, if you take away, and that's, I think Hughes was gone for three weeks where Ty continued to put the puck in the net. But if you kept Hughes in that lineup, he's probably closer to 20 goals by now. Yeah. And there's a comfort level there and he's got that championship pedigree which helps a young team like that because you can see how they look up to him. You can see the confidence he has. You can see when he goes into certain places, like he goes into Ottawa where he played junior and he scores and he goes into, you know, he's scoring in big places too. And uh, he's a guy that's consistently scored in the playoffs. But again, you look back at a, you look at a team that's just chomping at the bit to get over that line and be competitive in there. And they've got, you never know what's coming out of the net every night. Right. So for me, New Jersey, until they get a goaltender um, that they can count on every night, uh, it's going to be everybody left scratching their heads about how good they could possibly be. Would you pay the assets to go get John Gibson out of Anaheim to bring hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, and you got to stay away from it, but again, not having it in front of me, you got to think that because they've done so well with what they've added to their homegrown talent, um, you know, through the draft and then obviously the big trade with uh, San Jose last year. Um, but yeah, I'd figure out like, certainly my first round pick and stuff like that. And I know it's going to be a good pick, but uh, I have to think, I know in talking to Gibson's agent, just kind of picking away at some things, like, he's got a no trade clause, uh, but I got to think, you know, playing in an American market, you know, close to New York on a team that's up and coming, is would be huge for him. So yeah. that would be the guy I would target without question. And I think he would be the guy that immediately puts people on that. Wow. I don't want to play New Jersey. And again, I think that puts them thrust them into that above the, above the cut line. And then you just don't want to play a team like that in the playoffs. I think Gibson in the right situation still has enough left in the tank to do what he was doing to teams like us in LA driving us fits in the playoffs and stuff like that. So and I think it's a great fit because I think Anaheim is still, again, you've got John Gibson with probably two or three more great years left on a team that's rebuilding. So I, and they've got the, I think they've got a goal, a young goaltender in Anaheim too, that seems to be the real deal. So they, it's yeah, not Luke like, it's still yeah, 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 it's not like they're leaving the, the asset bank completely. No, no. Jeff Glass, a good friend of ours, goalie coach with the San Diego goal. Um, he's done a good job with uh, Lucas and, uh, in- getting him to uh, NHL ready. So um, great job for uh, Glasser there and, and Lucas as well. And yeah, Gibson just had a, him and his wife just had a, uh, had, I think their second child. So, uh, you know, those things usually do play in a factor if there is a trade maybe, but um, you know, we'll, we'll see if where, where that's at down the road, but uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, and I don't know, Lindy Ruff's job. I know there's been some conversation that he could be on the hot seat, but I do think that he, somewhat survives this because i don't think it's all on him and i i do think um uh, uh finn Strail kind of would really understand that too from a guy that's played the whole thing with the only thing i'd say with like i would think there's going to be some people the man there's been a lot of managers that have maintained their safety in spite of some pretty dis- disappointments and i would think that that's probably going to change dramatically if some teams don't uh, get on a bit of a roll here but it's one thing to change a coach but you, you got to have the right guy available to come in Right. Yeah. Well, they got Greener on the bench, right? So Travis Green. Well, there's my, I mean, and there's yeah. a perfect example of a guy that's, that's it's ready. Great. So, yeah. So if there was a case to be made on a switch there, that would be the guy they were probably in there. Cause he's not in there as an assistant coach. He's there as an associate coach, which is still might be the same situation, but, uh, um, you know, team Canada feuds, uh, a big upset loss here. Czechia takes them out. Uh, we'll move over to some junior hair talk and, uh, it goes some, uh, some scouting down some scouting conversations, but, um, you know, just, uh, not a tournament that they looked really their best at, um, they looked like they had some moments of, of great flash, but, um, you know, over the years, Canada's pulled out some of these wins where maybe they shouldn't have won. And, uh, today's a day where maybe they should have won, but they didn't win. And the bounce went the other way. Uh, Czechia beat some three, two, a big upset. Uh, where are you at here? I don't think we need a summit. I think we're okay, but, uh, just one of those things that maybe these other countries are, are now just kind of catching up slowly and it, and it's healthy for the tournament to have stuff like this too, probably not. For uh, the- well, I would think so. I yeah. mean, I saw the highlights. I'm not, I mean, again, 
I love the world juniors. I mean, I, it's the first time in age. I mean, cause usually in my 26 is the 26 is when my holidays end and I'm flying wherever the world juniors are. And I obviously a huge fan of it. I watch it. Um, but I think you just nailed it. I mean, you watch some of these games against some of these teams like a Germany or teams that used to be just easy cakewalks and the sport is really, you just look at the top scoring scores in the national hockey league it's not just a Canadian dominated sport anymore. And, and when it comes down to inches, anything like that can happen. I mean, you run into a hot goaltender. I mean, it wasn't like they were, you know, hemmed into their zone or anything. I mean, the thing you watch that puck hit is a, a stick, I think maybe two sticks and then an inside post before it goes in. Uh, that's a tough one. And I mean, I, I just think it's, there's so much expectations and rightfully so, because, you know, we are, you know, it's like, it's like when we talk about that next, you know, we can't wait to have Canada play against the U S and that, and the next best on best. And can you, and when you have, and everybody has their fun putting together the lineups and, uh, and there's always somebody that's left off a team that you kind of shake your head and it doesn't mean they're all going to be the best NHL players either. I mean, it's hilarious. Like, look, you talked about Toff. I mean, yeah. I mean, he got cut. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of great players that get cut from that team that go on to be great. Uh, they, they use it as a burn factor to go on to become great NHLers and, and you don't want to see them ever fail. Uh, it was painful for me. It was more painful watching the parents in the crowd. Like it was like, that was tough. Yeah. They, they all have, cause you realize how much they care about their kids and stuff. And there is part of that. Sometimes they jump ahead too. Cause they've seen in the past when the cameras are on and the kids win the gold and they're going to get their moment in the sun as well. Cause everything that happens, they immediately pan to the kid's family so I mean to go to Russell's is a Russell's family after something like that to me is a bit, you know, I mean, they got to do it, but come on. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't the kid. It wasn't like, you it mean, wasn't like the kid let in a bouncer from, you know, it, it, it hit everything in the building before it went in and then to show his family and like with their heads bandaged or buried in their head is a little, I guess it's great TV or if, if you've got issues, but I, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that, but no. hopefully they can get through it and, and the ones that mentally grind it out and use it to build on, you know, it's special. I mean, I remember for me, from an NHL standpoint, it's a huge factor. If you can see your kids win together, I still remember, I think it was 2008, just thrilled because on the, on the blue line, right. On the blue line, listening to the national anthem after they won the gold, we had Bernier, uh, Jonathan Bernier, Wayne Simmons, Thomas Hickey and Drew Doughty standing beside each other. Cause you, you start to see your future, learning how to win together, yeah. right? So that kind of stuff gets you excited. And then you look in the other blue line, and I think we had Oscar Moeller, who was one of our uh, – uh, he was captain of Swiss. So you, you get a little bit of moments of pride. I remember Oscar Moeller taking the first face off with uh, Thomas Hickey, and you're like, wow, here's the gold medal game. We got two of our draft picks, both captains, going at it in the World Junior Final. Um, I mean, Thomas Hickey ended up playing. I mean, Thomas is like, doing a great job on TV, but he had a – he almost played a, a thousand, but he, it, it was looked like a massive, we, people were booing when we took him at the, you know, then in fairness, probably went a little bit high, but what a great career and what a great kid. But yeah, I think that's part of it. When you see your guys win at that level and then you see the great ones that, you know, when they go, when you see their, like I coached uh, the 85 group. So I had like Richards and Carter, Perry, I mean, we were ridiculous. I had Biss was my best defenseman. That was probably problematic. Yeah, we talked about that on that yeah. episode. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he doesn't find that a problem. But uh, yeah. it, but anyways, but you think, and then you look at that, how could you not win? That was one of those team uh, candidates. And then you look at, cause, well, because Fanuk, Fanuk, Seabrook, he, they were all defensemen from the Western team. But when you put them all together in that, that team that play in Grand Forks and throw Sidney Crosby into the mix and Bergeron, you're like, okay, <laughs> yeah, here we I go. look at that team and I just go, wow, like not even close. Like as far as a team that just, it's not just they graduated, but when they go back and look at, okay, well he won a world juniors and then he won a couple Olympic golds. And then he's won a couple Stanley cups, a couple heart. It's like all of them. Yeah. They were like such incredibly gifted careers and it all started you know, winning together that group. Yeah. So it's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Great stories. But again, you never like to see, I mean, probably the people I feel most sorry for are the TSN staff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just, well, I, I'll tell you, I'm not, uh, 
I won't be getting up at 6.30 to watch the whatever, the Finns in Latvia or whoever think, else is battling for. I think our friend O-Dog is off the hook now. So, uh, Oh, my God. How yeah, about my, he was only doing Marty, it. Marty, uh, Gord Miller, who's a good friend, and Mike Johnson, who's known as, for calling his golden goals. He's probably going yeah. to have trouble. He'll be have trouble getting the pipes ready for the next round of uh, yeah. action in the semis. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, James Death, he's Cheryl Pounder, and uh, and also Bob McKenzie will take over the panel duties. Uh, you know, I don't know how many dealings you had with Dennis Bayak through your travels of the NHL, uh, but uh, just uh, just now he just finished his last game uh, calling. He is now retired. He just called the USA uh, uh, Latvia game. Um, you know, just kind of, a, I would say, a very icon- like very legendary voice in hockey. Yeah, uh, 100%. There's there certain, there certain yeah. guys that you just, you hear their voice and you immediately think, you know, whether it's the season, like for me, like whether well, Chris Cuthbert's to my personal favorite, right? And yeah. and I mean, I I mean, I kind of get spoiled with Joe Bowen and Ralphie at the radio here and stuff like that with the Leafs. But there's just certain voices that are so iconic when it comes to, and as I said, there's so many great ones. But for me, when I hear Chris Cuthbert, it just first of all, I don't know why I think CFL, which I'm not even like a big CFL guy, yeah, but I knew yeah. that voice was iconic there, and then hockey to another level and now it's like i think his son or something i'm doing a thing on the fan with his son and, and alish uh today so i mean they're obviously these people take great bloodlines coming along i mean mckenzie's kid and stuff like that but it is it's just it's amazing when I, and i also think when we won in 2012 and 2000 i think chris was like we were something like eight or nine and oh in games that he called so we just knew as soon as i saw him walk in the building i was like okay we're good yeah and we had that, uh, we, he knew, he knew cause I told him what his record was when, well, when he called our games, but special guy, that's for sure. It's funny cause Bax and I were talking, but Michael Bax and I were talking last night and he goes, what's the record now? And my record in the last, my last 60, we will go back to the last 16 cause I've, I've seen him play a lot. It's live, but my last 16 games watching Michael Bax and play live, I'm 15, Oh, and one. Well, so, so. that's an easy, that's an easy for me. I mean, too, well, well, now you got a press pass, which you're fine, but Michael yeah. back will just be handing his season tickets over to you. Yeah. Pretty so, much one thing I'm, I not learned an, I'm not an analytics guy, but that one's a pretty easy math, to, math assignment. Yeah. Yeah. We were kind of having a good laugh about that. And uh, one thing I did learn, you can't be a fan in press rows. So. <laughs> yeah. You have to be, I, I was doing a little, uh, I was doing a little tour around the Ontario hockey league there. And, and I found the same thing, like my buddy, James Richmond closes Mississauga. And I was trying to keep a, because I'm not associated with a team. Every time Mississauga scored, I was kind of like fanning out yeah. cheering for my buddy's <laughs> team. And I realized that you can't do that. <laughs> I, I a, it's funny. Cause I was sitting next to a, this is why I want to transition over the scouting part, but I'll finish the story. Obviously the one side I'm, was all media guys. And then, I was in the last seat where there where all the scouts would start sitting. So so I was sitting next to a scout and then when Backlund scored and I kind of cheered, he looked at me, he's like, You can't do that up here. He like whispered it to me. I was like, Yeah. Well, so also know. my two my two biggest uh like I got that thing down more because I initially was like very yeah, because you know you know you've got your uh they keep especially in the playoffs, they always go to the management box and if you're like I don't want to ever be like when like Pierre Dorian and Kyle whistling, throwing water balls around like that, but you got to yeah, keep your natural emotions. But I will. And, and the two biggest for me where I just couldn't control myself and it was funny. Well, obviously the one, cause it ended the season, but uh, we're both scored by Alec Martinez. For, yeah. We scored in double overtime against uh, the Rangers or sorry, uh, the Chicago Blackhawks in Chicago in game seven and it was very similar to uh the goal that check scored like it was one of those ones that you could have it felt like a time warp the puck as it traveled towards the net and found its way in and dean lombardi and i he almost clotheslined me out of the press box celebrating that goal and then marty's goal to win the stanley cup against the rangers again with the famous where lundquist lying in net there and marty doing the crazy hands yeah when they showed our box afterwards it was like <laughs> talk about euphoria as much as the guys were going crazy on the ice we were just losing our minds up in the management box so yeah um we'll finish up on this uh transition over scouting uh you know i was listening to american friedman they had uh, mccrimmon on the uh the recent episode and uh 
he talked about that they seen Arvin, Ivan Barbashev 40, about 45 times last year before they made the trade to get him. Um, and the question was, Elliot is kind of hearing through, you know, obviously he's the most connected guy in, in the industry that p- teams are going to scale back scouting, um, you know, and, and your kind of thought process on that. I, like Rick Kremen said that that's not what his organization is going to do. But do you think in, in terms of what would that be look like? Is that less viewings in person and just now we're always going to go to the video instead? Like how, where are you at with scouting now in, in pro hockey, junior hockey and um, what kind of and what kind of were the things that you like to go and, and look for? What are the top three things that kind of tr- tr- uh, trigger? Well, you, you can't. First of all, live viewings are critical. Yeah. Um, particularly at the am- amateur level, um, I think that, uh, and I don't. I I think pro scouts. And I remind me to come back to pro scouts because I, I've got a craw to pick there. Um, yeah, I, I just, you got to be real careful with this, just analytics, analytics video. You, you lose a lot of different things on the video. Um, the quality of the video in certain places, and you know, you can go from looking like you're watching a pristine uh, Steven Spielberg production to, you know, you go to another one, it looks like your Blair Witch project. So you're, you're, you're missing out on different things. You, you have to catch live viewings, but um, I'd be really scared about it at the amateur level for me, meeting people and learning about the kids. You can see so much about, but I think that was one of the things that I really, the kids that have made me look the best or my organizations look the best are kids that you just got to know, like you said, like the Foley's and Wayne Simmons and Mark Giordano and Curtis McDermott. And they weren't always the best players and God, I didn't know, have a clue that Wayne Simmons and Mark Giordano, when I put my backing behind them, I didn't think they were going to play a thousand games. And one guy was going to, one was going to be an NHL all-star. One was going to be a Norris trophy winner. I just knew that with their character, that they were never, ever going to make me look bad or let me down with, with the, what they brought. And if they were going to fail, it was going to get run over by a train on a train track. It was not going to be due to self-inflicted wounds or laziness. Yeah. And, and those are only, those are things you knew by getting to know people in person and being in front of them. Um, now my cry with pro scouting is if it does happen, they're their own worst enemies. Because I think for me, the amount of money that goes into a night of a pro scout being at a game or an amateur scout where you get a, probably a flight, you get per diem, uh, you know, you get a big dinner, uh, you know, you've got a great suit on, you're going to a game, you get these guys that you, it looks like I, you've probably seen it. You'll see it more now. Some of these guys, it's like, it looks like they've got Monopoly in front of them. They've got their lineups out with their highlighters through. It's magical. And then you get to like, Every time now the rinks are so good that every time something happens, if you watch all the pro scouts look back and they watch it on TV. Yes. Right. They've got access to. Well, they had all their laptops. So that what was happening last or that night was they had their notepads and then they had their laptops. So they were going back and like, even to the intermission, like there's like. Yeah. But you have, you can, you, if you're at, whatever if you're at in in a check rink in the middle of nowhere and you're not focused on a game and something happens you can't back up and go yeah. and see eight different replays of it to see something you might miss right and then when there's there's a time after a goal so you can go down and you can check your notes or you can write down the time because you're going to be able to go back and check it on video right and then if i'm an owner and this is where dean lombardi and i understand it he had a rule that you had to stay to the end of the game no matter what Right. You when you think about your thing, and I mean I understand there's traffic and you want to beat the fans out. But for me, if I'm an owner spending all this money and looking for reasons to not spend money, and I look up and it looks like someone's pulled the fire alarm and everybody's gone with six minutes left in a game or five minutes left in a game, in spite of the score, you're you're only you're only allowing someone to put into their say, why are we paying for this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, why are we paying all this money? for this privilege and priority and five minutes left in the game to beat traffic, it's empty. Yeah. And Dean Lombardi always had a rule that you couldn't leave the building and he made it easy. It was for pro scouts as well. An amateur was easy because he said you had to go interview a kid after every game. So it was never even in your mindset that you were leaving because you knew you had to go down and talk to a kid after every game, which took it out of our, I remember Chuck Ferrar, who I love to death. He used to, he was an old school guy 
and he'd be like, let's get the out of here. <laughs> Look at it. It's five one. Let's get them. And I'd be like, I just would be like, ah, nah, 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 nah. we, you know, our boss has the rules. That's great. You can say it, but we're not going anywhere. Yeah. We're going down. We're going to meet a player after a game or we got to talk to one of our draft picks. So I think pro scouts in general, when you're saying we don't need, um, you know, video and analytics is your biggest enemy to keep it from you keeping your job. When of course now analytics is going to be a part of things. It's the way it is. But if you're relying on a TV screen at a live event to write your report and then leaving early, why would you not, if you're yeah. an owner, say there's an area we can scale back on. They're just watching TV anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's my, and it's not because these guys are so passionate about it and they love their jobs, but if you do it, then stick around and, and realize and me being on the outside, I'll tell them like, and, I, and there's guys that are working right now that respectfully couldn't carry a torch to what I brought to the table. Yeah. And that's not being, I, I worked at it to it and I didn't leave early. I didn't cheat anybody, but if you're there and you're getting paid, don't cheat it. Okay. Don't leave early. Stay. Don't take shortcuts in it, in it because you're just giving your you're giving ownership who obviously is looking at any chance to save and shave money. And if you look at you're an owner and you look down and you got whatever 10 pro scouts and you know you go and you you watch closely and they're leaving with seven, eight minutes or whatever left in a game, it, it it gives them the opportunity to question the value of that position. Yeah. For sure. All right. Well, let's finish up on that. That's very well said. Uh, very well uh, spoken words uh, for you here on the uh, on the two months podcast about uh, 45 minutes long. So uh, again, Futes, appreciate the time. Uh, it's nice to connect with you here in the new year and um, hopefully uh, get a chance to finally see you here soon. I don't know. Maybe I'll have to make my way out east. But uh, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll have to just find a way to go watch you in your little new yeah. gig there up in the. Yeah. Yeah, you will find out. Be careful. One thing. Uh, it's not just it's unusual to get uh, attacked by a dog in the middle of a podcast. Be careful in Calgary because I don't care who you are. If you stand up too early for the national anthem, you're going to get concussed by that thing. Oh yeah. Mark, I've seen so many people literally stand up for their national anthem or in between their missions and no money, you know, it's there. You crank your melon off that bar and it's dizzy time. It's, it's dizzy time. So you have to be careful because it, it's that's the only one they say they need a new building in Calgary. When they build a new building, make sure they don't have that bench press thing above your yeah. press box. I'm seat. tall. I'm 6'3". So <laughs> you're, you're, you're dude. You're going to have to wear one of your, your work hard hats exactly. to the ring to save your head. Yeah, I'll have to ask uh, Peter Hanlon if I can uh, bring them bring in my pocket. So get away from those headbangers. So... But uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so thanks, thanks to you. We'll uh, we'll reconnect very soon, Futes. Uh, have fun and uh, all the best to you in the new year and to your family. Okay, thanks, buddy. Take care.